If you're a long-time viewer of my channel, I'm sure you already know that I really, really like the 1962 Hamahara Herbert Lom version of the Phantom of the Opera. But I kind of think I'm in a bit of a minority. It doesn't really sit well with Phantom of the Opera fans because it changes the story drastically. Uh, it moves the action away from Paris Opera House to a uh, fictional London Opera House. Uh, there is no romantic uh, interest between the Phantom and Christine. You know, the Phantom only cares about her as, as an instrument, really, as a pure voice to sing his work. You know, there is literally like no chemistry even attempted uh, between the pair of them, and that doesn't sit well with you know the Andrew Lloyd Webber fans who really like to ship Eric and Christine, even if in the original book the uh, interest was rather one-sided. And it also doesn't really sit well with fans of Howl Horrors as well, because although it was directed by Terence Fisher, who also directed a number of the uh, original classic Hammer movies, um, it doesn't have the usual cast, it doesn't have Christopher Lee, it doesn't have Peter Cushing... It's quite low on scares, there isn't really much violence, there's only really one on-screen murder that happens. There's no gore, and it doesn't have that sort of cleavage sexuality that the later Hammer films had, or even some of the earlier Hammer films had. And it's just considered as rather tame and uninteresting, and just doesn't sit well with the canon of the other classic Hammer movies. Now, I've already reviewed it, like, years and years ago, so if you really want to see my in-depth thoughts on that, you can uh, you can watch my channel and watch my other videos and, and, and hit that like button and subscribe and comment and, and like me on Patreon, because at the moment nobody does. Um, but, just to summarise why I like it, the original Gaston LaRue novel was a mystery story where you didn't know uh, what was going on with the opera house and all the weird goings on um, and similarly this although it has changed the story it is also framed as a mystery where the Ral character is the central character figuring it out and I really like that so in a weird roundabout way the Herbert Long version is, is the most faithful to the spirit of the novel at least if not the actual plot mechanics but even though I do like this film I, I admit there are many flaws with it and I wanted to look at some of those flaws today and see that how I would have gone about fixing them. So I like to imagine that perhaps the, the, the finished script that we've got, perhaps I was a script doctor back in the day and they gave me the script and said, right, this is what we're going with. Do one more draft and just fix some of the problems and then we'll shoot this version. And this is something I've been thinking about for like a year or two, how I would improve this film, and I've always wanted to make a video on it, so uh, here I am, finally. Now, first of all, let me talk about some of the core things that I really like that I'd want to keep. I really like the Harry Hunter character and how it's framed as a mystery, as I've already said. I really like the chemistry and relationship between him and Christine. I love the Ambrose Darcy character and how evil he is. I love Michael Goff, Michael Go, however you pronounce it. I love his performance, and I love that whole character, how over-the-top evil. I, I just love it. I really like the Professor Petrie backstory. Um, I know a lot of people aren't a fan of the acid in the face thing, and it, it's kind of lame how it happens in here, but I really like this idea of a genius composer who has just been totally ripped off, and the injustice of that, and how that turns him into the Phantom. I think that's brilliant, and that's something I keep. But there are several flaws. Um, one of the problems is the dwarf character, which, uh, depending on what you read and who you believe, was, was it as an invention to make the Phantom more sympathetic. They didn't want the Phantom murdering people, so they had to put the blame on this little dwarf character who goes around randomly stabbing people in the face. This may or may not have been to do whether this was originally pitched as a Cary Grant vehicle with him playing the Phantom. Um, I tend to believe that he was more for the Harry Hunter role, which would have made more sense, but... Um, there's conflicting reports about that. I don't really know what is true or what is not, but whichever way, for some reason, they wanted the Phantom to be wholly sympathetic. They don't want him directly involved in any murders. And I think that's one of the reasons why this Hammer Phantom is not a classic Hammer monster. He's not like this unstoppable force of evil, like, like the Mummy or Dracula or even the Frankenstein monster. He's just like a dirty, scruffy hobo who lives under the theatre and drinks really gross brown water uh, and he's just kind of pathetic um, he doesn't really have a strong menacing presence like the Lon Chaney version so that would be the first thing cut I would get rid of the dwarf character and put all the murders back on the Phantom and I'll explain how I'll do that in a minute also I really hate the ending I hate how Ambrose Darcy gets away with it scot free with, with just like a mild scare at the end I hate the way the unmasking is botched and just thrown into the end of it and that's a real missed opportunity for horror which this film is is lacking. 
but and, it, and it's taken me so long to do this video because I found that when I start like removing bits and changing bits of the story like the whole structure comes apart like a weird Jenga tower of Jenga-ness and it actually made me appreciate that, that the, the Hammer film is actually quite well constructed plot wise and that there's really not too much screwing you can do with it until it all starts falling apart. So if I was a script writer, the script doctor, whatever, this would be my pass at the story and these are the things I would change. And also let's assume we're keeping the original cast. I mean ideally I would recast it a little bit. I love Herbert Long but I think Christopher Lee was born to be the Phantom and he can also sing and he's just tall and he just has that look and that would have been amazing. Uh, it would have been cool to see Peter Cushing as the Ambrose Darcy character because he doesn't often get to play evil but when he does it's really good. But I'm more than happy with Michael Goff's performance. He's one of the best things about the movie. So let's assume we're keeping the casting the same. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. The introduction, I love this sort of slow walk into the Phantom's Lair. However, I would do it from the perspective of the Joseph Bouquet stagehand character. So for instance, so maybe this movie opens with Joseph Bouquet um, cleaning that little boiler room area and perhaps he stumbles on the secret entrance and he's like, oh, this is interesting. And he goes down into the caverns and then he hears the organ playing. So then we get that, that scary intro where we can just see the back of the phantom. And so this time, we, perhaps it's from uh, Bouquet's perspective, uh, his point of view is he approaches the back of the phantom and then he stands up to full height, spins around. You see a very brief look at his face without a mask. I'm sort of inclined to think that the Phantom wouldn't really care about the mask um, unless he's actually trying to make himself more presentable to Christine. So you get a really quick glimpse of a tiny bit of his horrifying face and then like the Phantom would just straight up stab him in the face or the neck or whatever and Joseph Bouquet would fall back into the filthy dirty brown water and perhaps we'd have a shot of like the, the body floating and all the blood and the water going red and then the Phantom of the Opera title would go over it and then we'd have something similar where we do the slow zoom into the eye but like it would all be really obscured and messed up and everything. Uh, awesome opening better than the original I think then the next scenes, okay, so there's some changes I'm going to make. Harry Hunter is not going to be a director at the opera. He's actually going to be a detective character um, who comes in a little bit later. Ambrose Darcy instead is like a Lord Andrew Lloyd Webber kind of character. So he's very rich. He produces plays. He directs plays himself. Um, you know, as we've seen from the original film, he's a control freak and just likes to do everything his way. So he's a very successful producer director and he's directing this production of St. Joan. I like all the petty vandalism that happens in the movie so I'd, I'd keep that in and I would keep the scene where the Maria character gets frightened in her dressing room but Harry Hunter wouldn't come to her aid instead she would go to Darcy and like scream about it and all the things she's seen but Darcy of course is very unsympathetic and says basically you've got to go out and sing or you're fired you'll never work in opera again anywhere in the world. So she does her scene, and the blooded corpse of Joseph Bouquet bursts through, as in the film, but perhaps a bit more graphic. So the opera house temporarily closes, and we bring in the Harry Hunter character. So he, this time he's a detective, he's like kind of a cool, analytical, I don't know, like a Columbo kind of thing, or whatever the London equivalent. Not quite Sherlock Holmes, not as brainy, just, just a, a dashing man about town inspector who's quite cool. So could be played by Cary Grant, but I'm, I'm happy with Edward de Souza however you pronounce it. Now Darcy obviously straight away wants to get back into the swing thing, he wants to open his opera and find a, a new girl, so I think when um, Harry Hunter is investigating the crimes and interviewing people, I'd like the audition process to be going on, and we see the character of Christine Charles auditioning. In this version, I want her to be singing the I Hear Your Voice song, which is a, a very important song in it, and I'll explain why later. I want Harry Hunter to hear her singing that and to be impressed, kind of a little bit love at first sight. He interviews her very briefly about the crime, but, you know, she's quite new, she's a chorus girl, she didn't know Bouquet, she didn't know of any of the weirdness going on. And then the film would largely continue, as in the original, she gets invited to dinner, she hears the voice in the dressing room warning her, Darcy does his lecherous thing, and also Harry Hunter is also dining at this restaurant and rescues her. This time he rescues her with the excuse that he needs to interview her more about the crime and takes her away from Darcy's clutches. He takes her to the opera house, we uh, we meet the rat catcher, um, as usual, the, the crone women, I, I love those, that's one of my favourite parts. They hear the voice in the dressing room and, and all that and they go to investigate but they don't really find anything. So they leave the opera house. Now the rat catcher we've already established is there, 
he sees something. He sees the phantom emerging from somewhere or in the, 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 you know, the rafters, the flies or whatever, and goes and does a little bit of investigation. And I'd quite like this a bit like the Claude Rains chase sequence where the, you know, he's following around just to give it a bit of action. There's not a lot of action in this. Um, so we can have a really tense cat and mouse scene. And then the phantom jumps down, stabs him in the eye or Punjab lassoes him or whatever because the other bouquet has already been stabbed in the eye in this version. And we see the phantom sort of drag the body off to his underground layer and this rat catcher disappears so like Harry Hunter doesn't specifically know that this murder has happened you know he covers his tracks quite well the phantom so the next day Christine gets a note saying that she's uh, you know she's never going to work for Darcy again because she turned him down after what happened at the meal um, so then Harry Hunter cheers her up and all that and they, they're going to do their little investigation thing and what I thought was while he sends Christine off to get ready for their date get a bit more information about the character of Professor Petrie so I thought it might be quite good if while Christine's off getting uh, changed um, Harry Hunter having a little chat with Miss Tucker who's doing work and she's sort of humming the music to I Hear Your Voice. Now as we've already established he has already heard that in the audition and he recognises it and says oh have you heard this song before or something like that and she explains oh how it was her favourite song and she hasn't heard it for so many years and talks a bit about the Professor Petrie character. Now here I also think we need to establish that Professor Petrie well he's kind of crazy like he is a musical genius but like obsessive compulsive manic depressive your mood swings the whole thing like he is a straight up genius but he is also straight up barking mad and perhaps she can talk a little bit about that and then when he asks what happened to her like she says that the one day he just snapped tried to kill you know an important person then went on the run which makes harry hunter think hmm interesting I wonder if there could be a link with with this music I've heard and the music of Ambrose Darcy. So, as in the film, they go off and investigate little things, and they go to the printing place and establish what Petrie was in trouble for was an attempted attack on Ambrose Darcy. Harry Hunter confronts Darcy about this, and he claims he never had heard of Professor Petrie in his life, and it's all lies and whatever, and he's just very cagey about it, and it makes Harry Hunter have a bit of suspicions that maybe Darcy is involved in these murders somehow. And while they're off Scooby-Dooing, of course, the romance develops, largely like it does in the film. Christine goes home after a lovely day of sleuthing, opens the window, instead of the stupid dwarf, the phantom is there. The first time we see him in his mask, and it's terrifying. So she faints, passes out, he takes her down below, and things progress, as in the movie. The phantom works at a near exhaustion. I don't know why this isn't in the movie, it should be, but the unmasking is a perfect opportunity. When she's so weak and frightened by this strange present, she just has to know who he is, pulls the mask off, and we get a really good close-up of a really, really horrible, messed-up face. And it's not just his face, it's like his whole body, his hands are all distorted, just he's head-to-toe disfigured, not just the face. So she passes out from the sheer fright. At the same time as all this is going on, as in the movie, Harry Hunter's investigating, trying to find stuff. He, he discovers that, that when Petrie was on the run after trying to kill Darcy, he jumped in the river after an accident in the printing factory. And he sort of tries to follow the path un, in the underground layer. And he hears Christine scream from the unmasking, and that's what sets him on the right direction. When Christine is passed out, like in the Cheney movie, Petrie has set up uh, an underground alarm system to tip him off if there are any intruders coming. So it starts clanging, and like the Cheney movie, he does what the dwarf does. He gets a breathing pipe and he goes under to attempt to kill Harry Hunter. How Harry Hunter is successful in the struggle and manages to pin Petrie down and like hold him at knife point or whatever, um, and like ask him what the hell's going on. Then we get the Professor Petrie flashback. In this version, again, I want to establish that he's quite a vulnerable, you know, mentally unstable person who can be exploited by someone like Darcy. Um, so his music is stolen, as in the film. And this time, I, I thought the way the accident was handled was a bit lame in the original, you know, where he just, like, throws a little bit of acid on the floor and somehow it, like, splashes up enough to, like, wipe out his whole face and it, it was just shot a bit unconvincingly. I want this to be a bit more thorough. I want this to happen in the daytime. So Petrie confronts Darcy at the printing press during the daytime, makes a big scene in front of all the workers. He starts smashing plates, acting crazy. Darcy tries to take him to an upstairs office. Uh, away trying to avoid making a scene and he confronts him about it Petrie says he's going to go to the police he's going to make sure everyone knows what he's done to him um, and Darcy's like you will do no such thing or whatever and like there's 
a little bit of a fight. And then because they're like in this upstairs room of the printing press, there's like all the chemicals there. I actually want, rather than it being an accident initially, I straight up want Ambrose Darcy to throw acid in Petrie's face like the Claude Rains version. And that is not enough for him. Um, while he's been wounded by that, I want Darcy to sort of push him through a window over a balcony into a vat of chemicals, Joker style. So his whole body is absolutely burned and mutilated. Petrie climbs out of the vat, runs into the street screaming, jumps over the side into the water. And Darcy, you know, says, he tried to kill me, I had no choice or whatever. Um, and he's sort of hailed a hero. Um, I want it established that Petrie probably did survive the fall that the police were looking for him underground but were not able to find him because it's such a labyrinth um, and that he is wanted for murder. This is why Petrie has to stay underground because in the original one like, he doesn't really have a reason to stay underground other than he's a bit burned I don't know like, why he would have cared, he was a bit of a loner he didn't have a romantic interest like Song at Midnight or anything. So like, I don't know why the Herbert Long Phantom didn't just resurface and tell the police what had happened, whereas in this one you know, he did, in front of witnesses, try and kill Ambrose Darcy. He's wanted for attempted murder. So that makes a bit more sense why he would hide underground and not really emerge, apart from these little petty acts of vandalism when he realises that his opera is being performed with Darcy's name on it. So he's like an opera house terrorist until he heard Christine sing his music and then he realised that he has to hear his opera performed perfectly before he dies. Now, now we come to the ending. This is the most problematic part of all, because up to now, I've, I've largely kept things the same. In the original, Petrie says, you know, give me one week and I will train Christine and I can hear my work perform and you'll never hear from me again and then I'm dead or whatever. And like, Christine gives puppy dog eyes and like, oh, please. And like, Harry Hunter lets him get away with it. I know in the original, like, he's not a policeman. He's, he's, a, he's a stage director. But there has been murders committed in the opera house. Like, like, he probably doesn't know about the rat catcher, but, like, the stagehand was murdered. If the Phantom didn't do it, he, he basically says, you know, his little dwarf assistant did it. Okay, maybe Petrie was lying. Even if he's not lying... The fact remains, Harry Hunter allows this murderous dwarf to run free around the opera house. At no point does he tell the police about what's happening. I mean, I guess he might have let Petrie off, but like, why wasn't the dwarf arrested? Like, why can he go around causing random acts of chaos, which like almost kills Christine? Why is that a thing that happens? So now in my version, because I've made Harry Hunter this detective, like it becomes even more problematic because why would he let him go? This is where I'm going to split multiple possible endings. I'm going to give you an ending I don't really like first. So in the first ending, he arrests the Phantom, he puts the cuffs on the Phantom, and you know, makes him stand trial. He also um, makes Ambrose Darcy comes to testify at the trial, and uh, through all the various evidence, he's also implicated for the theft and, you know the grievous bodily harm he does to Petrie and so he doesn't get away scot-free like it's established he will probably be arrested he will be ruined and um, the phantom for committing the murders is given the death penalty death by hanging so I fix the ending in that Darcy is punished and that the phantom must die the only part of the original ending I like is that he gets to see his opera performed and he gets to see Christine sing his work perfectly and I think that's a really important part um, so in, in this first ending that I'm doing it's a little bit mangled the only way I thought I could fix that is that when he's going to the gallows he's going up the scaffolding and Christine's in the crowd and she sings I hear your voice directly to him and it's like a really big emotional thing and then they kick the chair and he dies having heard his music perfectly performed yeah I'm not 100% happy with that, but it's an ending. It is an ending. But the next one is a little bit more like the original ending. Hunter kind of agrees. He lets the Phantom tutor Christine under his also his supervision as well. Um, he lets Christine perform in the opera. So in box five, you've got the Phantom and you've got Harry Hunter with a gun. He is supervising him. And basically, this is his final favour. He lets him watch the opera. And then it's understood, like, you're going to trial. Sonny Jim. Um, of course, Ambrose Darcy has to be punished. Um, one possible way of doing that is that Ambrose Darcy is watching in an adjacent box, and at the end, when all the applause is happening, uh, Darcy stands up and gets all the you know, applause and starts to give a speech about how great he is, basically, in his music. And this is too much for Petrie. And I thought he could jump from box to box and like throttle the life out of Darcy, throw him over the side. He is dead. Yeah. 
or maybe he stabs him in the face multiple times or garrots him or throws a little hidden jar of acid in his face or something punishes Ambrose Darcy because he deserves it. So then of course there's a big uproar, there's, there's police in the opera house that Harry Hunter's, you know, because Harry Hunter's told them what we are, what's going down. He has made security arrangements to make sure Petrie doesn't escape. He was just giving him one last favour to let him hit Christine. But like, it all goes wrong, so he kills Darcy, and then like, the police are shooting at him and stuff, a bit like the Charles Dance one. And this is where my idea is kind of genius, because the artwork, the posters, they all seem to feature this image of the Phantom riding a burning chandelier down to the ground, and it's an awesome image, and that doesn't happen in the movie. I don't know if it was a concept in an original script or whatever, but I fixed that. So the police are all shooting at him, and Petrie jumps onto the chandelier, and it's not like one of those lame wooden chandeliers, it's like a proper, like, gassy oil lamp one or whatever, you know, so it's lit with these, like, globes of oil you know, flames and stuff. Um, as the police are shooting at him, it shatters some of these these containers, which then throws, like, oil and paraffin or whatever it, it uses to light over Professor Petrie. He catches fire. The chandelier's on fire. He's on fire. The rope burns. The chandelier plummets into the audience. And one of the final images is the Phantom just riding this flaming chandelier to, like, absolute annihilation. Boom! Explosions. Death curtain comes down the freaking end what do you think of that version yeah better or worse comment below that's how i would do it if you enjoyed this let me know maybe i'll try and fix the Dario argento version at some point that would be a challenge wouldn't it so until you ever hear from me again if you ever do bye for now